What's up? I'm B, and welcome to my channel. I hope you are having an amazing day, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast. Today, we are doing episode four of The Deep End. I missed last week's upload because I came down with something fierce. I am sure you can hear it in my voice. It's not been a great week. I am trying to push through it, but right around two days ago, my body basically gave out and I had to end up having a nurse come to the house to give me a uh, like IV therapy. Basically, it's lysine, vitamin C, electrolytes, hydration, all that good stuff. That made me feel a little bit more clear-headed in the brain, but physically, we're struggling. So, I hope you can bear with me. I hope my voice doesn't bother you too much, but I missed a week already. I can't do it. I can't bear to miss upload after upload. So we are going to knock this out. Like I said, this is my video covering episode four of The Deep End, which is a documentary covering Teal Swan and her practices. And it's been a really interesting series so far. You guys have seemed to enjoy it, so I'm glad that we are interested in this together. After this video, we're going to have a little one-week break on the Teal Swan coverage, and I have a video about modesty culture coming out, and then after that, I will be reacting to Teal Swan's response to this documentary. I think it's going to be really interesting to see some of the things that she says about the documentary. I've seen a few um, articles in like researching certain things about what's gone down in these episodes that include snippets of Facebook posts and stuff like that. And so obviously I know that she was not happy and neither was Grazi. Grazi said some not nice things is how I'll phrase it about the documentary and how it made her look, but that's all going to be covered in another video. For now, let's dive in to episode four. We open with Tia leading a group meditation at a live event, and she is wearing a beautiful red beaded dress on stage, and the voiceover of the meditation plays over a montage of clips that mainly include Teal, Blake, and Juliana. Some of the scenes are from Juliana and Blake's wedding, there's some of Blake playing with Teal's son, there's some of Teal and Blake when they were younger, and then we also get clips of other followers of Teal. Um, we see Teal crying, Blake looking stressed out, then just like a variety of other random clips thrown in, like dogs playing with each other, and then the dogs growling, pages being burned, stuff that's kind of meant to set an ominous tone. So the meditation that Teal is doing is for cord cutting, and basically the concept behind this is that as humans, we have these invisible energetic cords that connect us to other people, and they can be positive or negative. So if somebody you're connected to or like one of your cords is connected to somebody uh, that's having like a negative impact on you, then in theory, you might need to energetically cut that cord. And in the meditation, Teal starts talking about how there are two kinds of connections. The first is positive, which feels like love, care, fondness, and so much more. And there's a connection that's negative that feels like fear, worry, obligation, desperation, jealousy, and so much more. And she wants people participating in this meditation to think about why they've allowed somebody to attach this cord to them and consider what they are afraid of happening if they no longer have this connection to that person and then mentally pick picture themselves cutting the cord and seeing it fall to the ground. Cut to the title card. After this, we see Blake laying in a bathtub and he's holding himself under the water and he's holding his breath and then he sits up and he looks really stressed out and we hear Teal calling for him because it is time for Teal to actually meet Molly, the private investigator. It's going to be over a video chat, but she's never directly interacted with Molly before. And so prior to this, it's just been Blake and Matthias who were communicating with her and giving her all the information that she needs. Teal says that she's hoping the private investigator got somewhere because she needs to get a horrible slander piece that was written about her taken down. The piece in question in this particular scene is an article from Vice titled, Yes, There Are Women-Led Cults. Teal seems nervous to hear what Molly has to say and says that she's hoping they can get somewhere with her because then people will probably shut her, Teal, out less. And she also asks if she should be afraid of Molly or if Molly is nice. And then the documentary cuts to Molly outside and she's at her house and she's feeding a frog with tweezers. So it's kind of like the juxtaposition of like, oh, should I be afraid or is she nice? And she's literally just outside in nature feeding a frog and talking to it. 
So um, we see that and then we see the meeting begin and it starts out kind of pleasant, but then, of course, things do take a turn for the worse. Molly says the two main questions she was trying to answer were, does Teal cause suicide? And the answer to that is no. And then the second is, does Teal run a cult? And the answer is maybe. Teal looks really shocked when Molly says maybe. And Molly goes on to say that the non-negotiable list solidified that for her, but she wants to dive deeper into it with Teal. Teal tries to defend herself uh, and this non-negotiable list by saying that with the kind of work she does, there is no work-life balance, so everyone who works with her has to be on the same ship. But Molly asks Teal a series of questions like, would she say she is the one that has the total and only answer? Isn't she the driving force? Does she attempt to limit outside relationships, including those with family? If somebody resists buying into the mission, are they countered with questions of their own beliefs or their own selfishness, like they're not willing to commit to the cause? And once you're in, is there heavy pressure to stay in? Teal, of course, says no to all of these questions, which is kind of ridiculous when you know what we know about Teal and the experiences other people have had when they were in the inner circle and once they've tried to leave. Like, we know that Teal does try to limit outside relationships. And this isn't even just from people who have left the inner circle. We hear this from Grazi. We hear this from Teal herself about how Juliana can't go to Germany to visit her mom. You have to limit the outside relationships. And so for Teal to say, like she goes on this rant and she's like, I want everybody to be together. I want everybody to be within this oneness. Like that's my ideal. I don't ever want to limit outside relationships. But we know that that's literally just not true. Maybe Teal wants everybody to come together if they align directly with her, if they, you know, abide by everything she says and everything she wants them to do. But if they have different beliefs or they're not really interested in her kind of personal and spiritual development, she sees them as a threat. So she goes on this rant and it's just kind of ridiculous to watch again when we know what we know. So anyway, Teal has said that she's totally the opposite. She doesn't want to limit these outside relationships. And after being asked all of these questions, Teal tells Molly that she's stepping into a territory that frustrates her and she doesn't know what the answer is. The conversation appears to pretty quickly come to an end after this because it's kind of clear that Molly and Teal are not going to be on the same page. Once the call ends, Matthias looks really stressed and Teal says that that was not an acceptable thing she just heard from Molly. She also tells Matthias and Blake that she just lost trust for them because her image is very important to her. They're both apologetic to Teal and she tries to downplay the non-negotiables by saying things like, what am I supposed to say? No, I don't want you to be dedicated to this. No, I don't think it's a problem if they have partners that are completely incompatible to this. Blake apologizes and says that it's not fair that Teal has to go through this and then the three of them just sit in silence. Next, we see Teal and Juliana out on the balcony and Teal says that she has a question for Juliana. She wants to know what would make her go back to Germany. And Juliana says, quote, what comes up is being completely alone, end quote, and Teal does not say anything in response, which I think is a weird question. I mean, the only motivation that I can think of for Teal asking that specific question is that Teal wants to get rid of Juliana and she wants to know how she can get her to go back to Germany. Obviously, we know Teal and Juliana aren't really super close. They're not the best of friends. It seems like they're both kind of trying in their own way to get along, but there's not really much compatibility there. I think that Juliana is expecting something that um, she's expecting a reality that's different than the reality she got when she came to live with Teal's inner circle. And I think that Teal feels very possessive over Blake. And so having Blake spend so much time with and literally get married to Juliana is a threat to her. And so obviously, they're not really going to mesh super well. But I think if Teal wanted to understand how committed Juliana was, or, you know, she wanted to understand her motivations a little bit better, that's a reasonable thing. And she could have asked it in a different way. But I don't think there was any good intention behind asking the question. I think it was, how do I get rid of this girl? Okay, so she would have to feel like she was completely alone. Okay, how can I drive a wedge? That's just my thought. And man, this next scene is really hard to watch. 
I can't even imagine being put in the position that Juliana is about to be put in. Like, I don't even know what my reaction would be to it, but I think Juliana handled it like a champ. So in the next scene, there is a meeting of the inner circle. Teal says, quote, I am really angry today. I basically realized in the last few days that it's it's because a personal truth is not actually being shared. There's a lot of reasons why. I mean, like people have many reasons why they resist a personal truth, whether it's to avoid consequences or because admitting to it is going to make them feel bad about themselves or whatever it is. Juliana, that's what's happening with you. You feel like an adversary to me and I need that to change, end quote. Juliana is confused by this because she doesn't know what the word adversary means, and Tristan tells her that it's an enemy. Teal goes on to say, quote, I need your truth on the table, what you actually think about me pretty fucking quick. I could tell you all kinds of personal truths about what you think is unhealed about me, and unhealthy about me, and unhealthy about the company I run, unhealthy about the house I lead, unhealthy about my dynamics with people. It's literally unhealthy, 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 and then... She trails off that last unhealthy and starts laughing. And Juliana is clearly blindsided by this conversation because she doesn't really have anything to say and she just looks really confused. Teal keeps going and she tells Juliana that her energy field has been insulting Teal's since the second she landed from Germany. It's really hard to watch because, like I said, Juliana looks confused and she doesn't have anything to say. She's just kind of like... It's like she starts to say something, but she's so just caught off guard by this whole thing that nothing is coming to mind for her to say because she doesn't know how to respond. I wouldn't either. Like, imagine that. Imagine you are living in someone else's home, just trying to do your best. You're just trying to be there. You're trying to participate and, like, do what you can to fit in. There's a language barrier because. Juliana's from Germany. She speaks German. She speaks English incredibly well. But still, like, as somebody who's bilingual, sometimes there's just things where I'm like, "Ah, I can't quite grasp it. I can't quite grasp that thing. And it's very hard for me to express it um, in my second language. And so you combine all of those factors and you just have Teal, who is this very strong, opinionated person. She's very forceful coming at you. It's like, how do you even begin to process that in order to respond in a way that's not going to make things worse. That's not going to escalate things because I don't think Juliana would want things to escalate. And we can see that in the response that she gives because somebody off camera, it sounds like Matthias, uh, asks Juliana what she feels when she hears that. And then Teal cuts in to tell her that if she's unaware, she has a smirk on her face. Please note that at this point, Juliana in no way, shape or form has a smirk on her face. If you're watching the video version on YouTube or Spotify, here's a picture of what she looked like in this moment. Not not a smirk in sight on anybody except for Teal, because Teal is smirking. So Juliana finally responds, and she says that she doesn't have a smirk on her face and that she's actually afraid, and Teal tells her that she should be. Then Teal says it would be interesting to hear what Juliana thinks her attitude towards Teal is and then go around and ask everyone else what they think Juliana's attitude towards Teal is. Juliana tells Teal that she thinks that Teal is very clear in what she wants, that she's dedicated to her mission, and that she's a powerful person. But obviously, this does not satisfy Teal, and she calls this a sugar-coated answer. So then they go around the room and... Everybody has to say what they think Juliana's attitude towards Teal is. And there's a lot of things said. There's some insults thrown at her. I won't name everything that was said about Juliana, but some of the things that were said uh, are that Juliana doesn't recognize authority. She thinks Teal doesn't care about people. She thinks that Teal's power hungry and that she's manipulative with her sexuality. Juliana is jealous of Teal and she's threatened by her and that Juliana wants what Teal has. So Juliana takes this in quietly. She's just sitting there very stoically, just letting them say all of these things about her. And then Teal, who's been writing notes the entire time, just starts reading everything off of the page that she's been writing on. Teal says that Juliana thinks she's a narcissist and that she contributes to painful situations, that she's an attention whore, and that she controls other people and their perception of things. So Teal is saying that that's what Juliana thinks about her. And it's hilarious to me that that last one is that Teal is saying Juliana thinks that Teal controls other people and their perception of things. 
all while Teal and her inner circle are trying to tell Juliana how she feels about Teal. Like they're literally trying to control her perception of things. So anyway, Teal keeps rattling things off of this list and Blake is obviously there as part of the inner circle. Blake, Juliana's husband, is having a really hard time taking all of this in. He's resting his head on his hands. He's breathing really intensely. His face is getting really, really red. And it looks like he's holding back tears, hearing all of these things being said about his wife. And Teal finishes reading the list and says, quote, that's what I get to live with in the room with me every day. And suddenly you're the one being attacked, end quote. I don't know if if Juliana said something about how it feels like she's being attacked, that if she did, they didn't include it in the documentary. But like, so, so I don't know. I don't know if Teal just says this out of the blue and she's trying to portray that Juliana is making herself a victim or if Juliana literally was like, this kind of feels like you're attacking me. In this situation in particular, yeah, Juliana's being attacked. Maybe, maybe Teal does feel like Juliana doesn't like her. She's trying to undermine her, um, you know, her, her energy field is insulting Teal's. And yeah, who wants to live with somebody who they feel like doesn't like them and doesn't align with their mission? But in this particular instance, Juliana is the one being attacked. And I feel like there's probably a better way to try and resolve the issue if you feel like you and Juliana are not quite on the same page. But of course, that's not what Teal's interested in. She doesn't want to resolve things. She wants Juliana gone. She doesn't like Juliana. She wants Juliana to leave and she wants Blake to stay so that way she can continue with the status quo. She wants things to be how they were before Blake and Juliana met when Blake was there for her for everything she needed. He was, you know, fully dedicated to everything they were doing and he didn't question her and he didn't have somebody from a different perspective saying, hey, um, maybe this isn't like the right thing to do. Because in the last episode, we saw Juliana tell Teal that she couldn't force people to do things if they weren't ready for them. And that's when Teal was like, you just crossed a line. So obviously, there's some tension there. Um, but instead of wanting to fix it and make things better, Teal wants to exert her authority and be like, you're in the wrong completely. You're trying to attack me. And you know, you have all these horrible thoughts about me. It's just a really uncomfortable situation to watch. I feel like I keep getting ahead of my notes because the next note I have is that Blake joins in and he asks Teal what the point of all of this was, if it was to address things and move on or what. And Teal looks at him and says, quote, I don't know, Blake, what was the point of this? End quote. All right. So at this point, Blake goes to sit by Juliana. They've been sitting in a circle and they were kind of opposite each other because Blake was sitting next to Teal, but he just gets up and goes across the room to sit by Juliana. Anyway, that's where the scene ends. And then the very next scene is Blake packing up his things because he is stepping away from his position as Teal's head of operations. So we see Blake, Teal, Matthias, and Grazi all in the kitchen talking together. And Matthias says that he needs to set up a meeting so that way they can figure out how to transfer Blake's responsibilities. Teal says that she's pissed off because this goes against the 18-year promise that they made about how this would be their life. And she says that this is breaking her heart. And Blake says, me too. Then... We see something very similar to what Jared said happened to him happen to Blake because Teal says, quote, I think you're weak. That's my honest truth. I think you lack bravery. I think you lack honor, but you've made your bed and now you get to lie in it. You who chooses a weak path must not become a match to greatness, end quote. Blake just lets Teal kind of go off on him and he doesn't really have a response. It's very clear that if you're looking at Blake, he's distressed by this, but he doesn't say anything to her other than just a really defeated sounding okay. And I think that that pissed Teal off because she wanted a reaction. She wanted something more from him. She didn't want him to just take it in with like honor and dignity and, and accept these insults and let her say whatever she wanted to say. She wanted Blake to fight with her because I think honestly, if somebody's willing to fight with you, I think that means that there's still an emotional attachment there that you can um, either salvage if, if you're like looking at things from a healthy place. You know, if if you're fighting with your partner or your spouse or a friend, it means that there's still something there and maybe you guys can work through it in a healthy way. But for Teal, 
she's probably hoping that that emotional tie is still strong enough that she can manipulate him into staying or at least manipulate him into feeling bad about himself for leaving and by him just saying, okay, I don't think she's getting that. She's not feeling that satisfaction. That's just my speculation. Anyway, Teal decides to double down on the insults and she says, quote, I have no patience for this anymore. If you want to flip a favor around like you guys have been doing to me, the level of fucking judgment you have on me being a narcissistic bitch, you're a fucking absolute loser, always will be. Never forget those words. End quote. Obviously, those are horrific things to say to anyone, and they clearly go against what Teal said when she was talking to Molly. Molly asked if once someone's in the inner circle, is there pressure to stay in? And Teal says no. But now that Blake's leaving, she's saying all these horrible things to him to make him feel bad for leaving. And so she says this, Blake doesn't address anything Teal said. He doesn't respond to any of it. But instead, he says he's going to finish packing up the rest of his stuff and head out. And then he tells Teal that he loves her and gives her a really big hug. She leans into the hug but doesn't reciprocate it, and then he gives Grazi and Matthias hugs and they both hug him back. As somebody watching from the outside, it's obvious that this entire situation is upsetting for Teal, and I can understand why she would be experiencing a wide range of emotions about this person that she's relied on so heavily for years deciding to leave her, but instead of trying to find a way to at least salvage some of the relationship, she, it's like she insists on burning it to the ground. I'm not going to call Teal a cult leader, but that sounds like culty behavior if I have ever heard it. When someone decides to leave, they are ostracized. They are torn down. They are told that they're nothing, that they would be nothing without the leader or without the organization, that they have no purpose, that they're worthless. They're told all of these horrible things because it can't just be, oh, this is no longer for me. I'm going to, you know, separate a little bit, but let's stay friends. It's you have to cut them off completely, one, to make them feel bad and make them feel like they're not making the right decision, but then to also set an example to everybody else. If, if Teal can say these things to Blake, who was so close to her, who was so much a part of the organization, if she can treat him that way, how is she going to treat you if you decide to leave? If you say, you know, what, I don't want to be this involved, you know, I still like the teachings, but maybe I want to take a step back. No, there's no option. You're done. You're cut off. So Blake and Juliana leave and they move into their new apartment and sadly Blake finds all of his fish have died while being transported and he ends up taking them outside and burying them in the ground and he is just sobbing the entire time he's doing this. And something kind of interesting to note that um, isn't really explicitly gone over in the documentary but this apartment that they move into it looks like a, a decent apartment, but it sounds like it's maybe by a, a highway or like a really busy road. When Blake is outside burying these fish, um, it's like you can hear cars passing by really loudly. And the apartment doesn't really look like a luxury apartment. It looks fine, but it's not super duper nice, kind of like how Teal's house was. Like Teal's house looks really nice. It's very unique and nicely decorated and it's spacious and it's by a walking path you know it's in beautiful nature and then you have this apartment where it looks like they're on the third floor of this apartment it's an outside entrance they're by a busy road it's kind of dimly lit you can see the difference in kind of quality of the home that you're going to be living in or quality of the environment and again i'm not saying that to judge their new apartment but i think that when you're talking about somebody who is potentially deciding to leave Teal, they might also have to contend with the fact that if they're in her inner circle, if they're working for her, they're not making any money. They're working in exchange for knowledge. And so not only would they be leaving something that's familiar to them, but they probably don't have the money to go and live the same kind of lifestyle that they've been living when they were with Teal. And not only that, they might not even be able to afford to leave at all unless they have someone who's willing to take them in. And that option is going to be significantly limited if you've cut off your family because Teal helped you quote unquote recover memories of abuse that led you to cut them off. So that's a really complex thing to kind of wrestle with. If you're in the inner circle and you decide to leave, not only are you losing Teal, you're losing your community, you're losing the people that you thought were your friends, 
you're losing all the people you socialize with, all the events that you're used to, and the home that you've gotten used to, and not necessarily having to worry about money because things are taken care of for you as a member of the Teal tribe. So it's just a lot to adjust to. Next, we see Teal in Blake's old room, and she's using a knife to scrape off the stickers on the window. Blake had his name up there and a few other things, and so she is just scraping those off. And then the documentary shows her having to dye her hair herself, which is like a callback to the first episode, because in that episode, we saw Blake dyeing Teal's hair for her. And then they go back to Blake, and he is getting ready to post in the Teal Tribe Facebook group that he is stepping back from his role in Teal Eye. And I was curious about what kind of post this might have been because obviously Blake and Teal did not leave on great terms. And so I was just curious how he would frame it. And I was able to find the post. I'll link it down below because I won't read the whole thing to you. But some of the things that Blake says in this post are that um, he wants to thank Teal for everything she does. Teal Swan, the GOAT. For those of you that don't follow sports, GOAT stands for the greatest of all time. I am so blessed to be able to call her my family and will be eternally thankful for all she has done for me. He talks about some of the lessons that Teal taught him. He frames him having to leave as like a shortcoming on his part and not anything to do with Teal. He says, quote, I wish it were true, but I'm not quite built for some of the things required to change the world on the level that Teal Swan is, end quote. At the end, he says, quote, also, I want to thank you, Teal, for everything you have done, everything you do and everything you will do. It is my hope that everyone reading this might be inspired to do what Teal Swan teaches, to fervently pursue your inspirations and your passions, end quote. So he says some very nice things in his Facebook resignation letter. And I think it's just really interesting to see Blake frame it in that way, to not say anything bad about her even after we heard her say all of these horrible things directly to his face. And I don't know if it's because, you know, for how long they've been together and uh, how much of their lives they've spent together, he kind of put her on this pedestal and he always saw her as somebody who was like the greatest teacher and she could help anybody through anything because she's been through the worst of it and she's made it on the other side. And so he still kind of holds her in this elevated light. Or if it's maybe for the benefit of the outer circle, he doesn't want to... Um, like hurt them because even though it didn't work out with him and Teal, even though she kind of turned on him, he still thinks that she has those powers and he still thinks that she can help those people. I'm not sure why he decided to do that, but I do think it shows that Blake's character is not that of someone who wants to make things worse. It's not somebody who's vindictive and vengeful. It's somebody who wants to do what he can in his mind for the greater good. Although another theory that just popped into my head is that maybe it, he was thinking, well, I don't have to blow things up. Like, I'm just going to leave gracefully because I know that this was all recorded and so it'll come out in due time. Maybe that was also his thought process. I don't know. I'm not him. Anyway, we see him writing this post out and getting ready to post it and he is pretty nervous about it. But Quickly, the responses start coming in and they appear to be mostly positive because there's people thanking Blake for all he's done over the years and wishing him the best going forward. And while Blake is like reading these responses out loud, it goes back and forth from Blake reading them to Teal, Matthias, and Grazie reading the responses come in. And when Teal sees encouraging messages coming in, she gets irritated. She tells Matthias that she wants him to sit with the fact that all of these people who are congratulating Blake for abandoning her are men. She follows that up with, quote, All these people are like wishing him and his wife a wonderful life together, and if they really knew what happened here, they'd be wanting her dead. They would, end quote. I just feel like Teal is making herself a victim of misogyny in this because we've heard her do this before. We've heard her say that people hate her because she has a vagina and opinions at the same time and she charges money for retreats when people think that she should do it for free. And again, I do think that there are some people who probably um, do not like her because of misogyny. There are probably some people who see a powerful, strong, opinionated woman and immediately they're like, mm, no, who does she think she is? But the majority of like level-headed, reasonable people don't have an issue with Teal because she's a woman with opinions. 
It's because of her behavior and the things that she says. And so even in this, Blake isn't coming on Facebook and being like, bye, idiot. Teal sucks. I got to go. I'm abandoning her for a better life. And all these guys are like, yeah, stick it to her. That's not happening. He goes on. He thanks Teal. He says, I'm not built for it. I can't do it. I can't hack it. Teal's on another level and the pressure just got to me, but she's amazing. She's the GOAT. I want to thank her. And people are saying, thank you so much for what you've done, Blake. Best of luck. Like, this is not misogyny. This is not people saying anything bad about Teal or trying to tear Teal down or congratulate Blake for abandoning her because of misogyny. Anyway, they go back to Blake and he's getting pretty emotional about all of these encouraging comments, which makes a lot of sense. He was very nervous. And so I'm sure it's uh, a big relief to hear people not hating you for leaving. And I think that this is a really powerful example of how different people in the past that Molly, the private investigator, interviewed were saying things are very different for the outer circle versus the inner circle. Outer circle is personal development. Inner circle is very much cult. Uh, that's what people have said. And so we see this. People are on the Facebook group. They're not in Teal's inner circle. They don't live with her. They don't do every single retreat. They're just people interested in moving forward in their lives and like making themselves better. And so they see Blake doing something that he says is the right thing for him and thinking Teal again, saying very nice things about her. And they're like, hey, that's great. Good job. Compared to what Teal said when Blake left. And I think something that really bothered me about the scene of Blake leaving and Teal telling him that he's a fucking loser. He always has been and he needs to remember those words and he's pathetic and all that is that Matthias and Grazi we're in the kitchen with them. They were there and they didn't stick up for Blake. They didn't like, they just let Teal say that stuff. And they just sat there and, and they didn't stick up for him or try and defend him or try and make the situation a little bit better. And I understand why they wouldn't because obviously they've seen what happens when you go against Teal, but it's just another red flag that they're sitting there watching this person who's supposed to be light and love and healing going off on somebody in a very toxic way and they don't feel comfortable saying anything they don't feel comfortable speaking up or or maybe they don't even see anything wrong with it maybe they think well Blake went against the non-negotiables so he deserves it that's a scarier thought red flag <laughs> outer circle very much personal development wishing Blake well inner circle very much cult he's pathetic and he's not built for greatness Teal then says that she's not been able to cry about the situation because it feels like she's at war, so it doesn't feel like this is a place to cry, and that her main concerns are trying to figure out how they can protect themselves legally and how they're going to recover financially. She also says that the person she is closest to has just dealt her the worst hand, and then she does start to get choked up. Legally, I'm not quite sure what she's referring to financially. I don't know if that's having to find somebody that they might have to pay because Blake was like her videographer and he did a lot with her production. So I'm not sure if they would have to like hire somebody and actually pay them or if they need to train somebody or if maybe the video equipment was Blake's and so now they need to get more. I have no idea, but Teal makes a lot of money. So either she's being overly dramatic or there's something that we don't know about that is causing her to be concerned about legalities and financial recovery. Either way, um, I'm going to play a clip where Teal explains why it's so difficult for her to ha for her to have lost her relationship with Blake. I can build every relationship in my life on top of this one. Because I didn't trust it all. And he's the one that taught me how to trust. And he's ruined it all. So for 18 years, I was like, I mean, I can't tell you how many in the beginning, how many therapists were like, you have to trust this person. This person has proven that he will never leave you. This person is the person you have to open up to. Stop being like you are. Stop distrusting people. To the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to have to accept that he's proven himself. So I built my life on the foundation of Blake Dyer as my family. He's broken every f promise he made. What is it that I should have done to make Blake feel valued or to make Blake value this more or love me more? Like, what is it that I should have done? 
I know the most dangerous thing in the world is to think you're the good guy. So I'm awake at night doubting myself because that's what I teach other people to f***ing do. Consider that maybe you're not the good guy. That's the only way you're going to be able to change your behavior to make relationships work in the future. The thing is, I can't figure out what the f*** to change, so... Something really interesting is that Teal presents herself as if she is healed from all of her trauma. That's why she can lead people because she's healed, because she's gone through the worst of it and she's gotten out on the other side. She has her completion process, all this stuff. Like she says that she's so healed. She's so enlightened. She's so above everybody else, but she can't trust people. And when Blake leaves, that just like crumbles any semblance of trust that she could possibly have for anybody else because all of that trust was built on the basis of trusting Blake. That to me doesn't sound healed and that's okay. Like it's totally fine to, ha I mean, not that like it's great to have trust issues, but it's totally normal to have trust issues. So I'm not trying to shame her for feeling that way and for being upset and saying like, wow, this really rocked me in a particular way that's going to have a massive impact on my life. But hearing Teal say this goes against pretty much everything she presents herself to be. If she really was so healed, she could still say like, man, this really sucks to lose him. I trusted him a lot. I relied on him for a lot of things. My feelings are really hurt. But I don't think that would impact. If somebody is healed, I don't think the natural response would be like, now I don't trust anybody ever again. Everything's crumbled down because I built every other relationship of trust on the basis of trusting him because I was told he would never leave me. That doesn't seem healthy. If you trust somebody um, that you're in a relationship with, whether it's a friendship, a family relationship, whatever, you can trust them, but you don't trust them because you think they'll never leave you. You know that they're choosing to be in a relationship with you and you're choosing to be in a relationship with them. And there can be a very strong trust there that's a really important part of your relationship. But that doesn't mean they can't ever change their mind and choose that they no longer want that kind of relationship with you or that close of a relationship with you. Just because you trust someone doesn't mean you get to take them for granted and just assume that they'll always be there for you no matter what you do or how you treat them. I don't really have a nice bow to put on the end of that rant. I just had to kind of like get it out of my brain because it's just something to think about. Teal has these very real human emotions, which she's a human. Obviously, she's going to have those things. And, you know, not being fully emotionally healed doesn't disqualify somebody from being a great leader. It doesn't mean that she can't teach you things. But I think it would be a lot more powerful if she owned those things, if she didn't try to hide them and then lash out when she feels the cracks starting to get a little bit wider, starting to rip open a little bit. If she was open about them and embraced them and told everybody, like, I'm still working on myself, that's a leader that I could see myself following, not Teal, but like the kind of leader who is open about their emotions and their struggles and things that they're going through. That's something that I look for in a leader. I don't look for somebody who says like, I'm elevated. I'm an alien. I'm so much more enlightened than anybody else on the planet. Like I am up here and everybody else is down here. That's not appealing to me. And you have a leader who says things like that, but then behind the scenes, we see the emotions and it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. That's part of the flaw in the teal swan presence and the teal swan teachings is she says one thing but then she behaves in a different way anyway let's get back to the notes because if i don't get myself back on track soon i fear that the entire rest of the video will become derailed anyway after that scene ends we go to a back and forth between teal outside running and one of teal's live events and what it looks like is it's a live event, but it's before anybody's come on stage. The audience is there and they're watching one of Teal's videos. And in that video, she talks about how your emotions need to be expressed energetically so that way you can get the emotions out. Otherwise, that energy will sit in your body and it will rot. She says we have to positively embrace our negative emotions as a part of our living, breathing experience, which 
I can agree with. Of all the criticisms I have about Teal, I will never say that she is a proponent of toxic positivity. So that's good, at least. After that scene, Teal is conducting a meeting with the members of her inner circle. And there is a new girl in this meeting that I haven't seen before. So I'm not sure if she's a new addition after Blake left or um, if we just haven't formally been introduced to her and she's been there the whole time. I have no idea. Teal says, quote, Here's the problem we get to address today is the fact that I am not protected if any member of my team finds a partner. It's like I don't even have the option to put up boundaries around that person if they're totally incompatible to what I'm doing and I don't get to say anything about it otherwise I'm the nightmare. I want you to be able to get partners but I also, given what's previously happened, don't really want you to have partners because this has just been such a problem for me. What all of you are is you're either my greatest protection or my greatest liability. I need you to see that today. So what we're trying to do is make up a contract to make you not a liability, end quote. She then asks how, as a team, they will keep her safe, and Cyan says they need to clearly define what consequences people are saying yes to if they bring a partner into the inner circle. And Teal agrees and adds that she needs to be able to get rid of someone if they bring in a partner that is dangerous to Teal. The team starts throwing around ideas that include, but are not limited to, team members putting the pressure on their partner to choose the lifestyle that aligns with the team member because that is their boundary, enforcing the fact that the non-negotiables are non-negotiable, not only for the team member, but for any partner they have. No babies. I'm not sure what language exactly they used if they ended up including this in a contract, but someone asks if Teal wants to bring kids into the contract, and Teal says, quote, I can't be kept awake at 3 o'clock in the f morning before an interview by a screaming baby, end quote. And another team member says that all of the girls on the team are on board that they are not having kids. I feel very conflicted about this contract being made because on the one hand, I can understand that if you have a high power, high pressure position, there might be certain guidelines that you need to abide by and you need your team to abide by in order to be effective in their roles. But seeing this conversation go down just makes me feel uneasy, knowing the fact that like they're all agreeing to these things and it's implied that this is like a lifetime commitment. Teal says that people can leave if, you know, if things don't align, they need to speak up and they need to talk to Teal. But again, when Molly asks Blake, like, do you think people would be comfortable telling Teal that, no, this isn't aligning with me anymore? And Blake says, yeah, no. That's where the issue comes in. It's not just like a business transaction of, okay, I'm agreeing to do this for one year. This is what my life's going to look like. And so I'm not going to do anything that's going to take away from what I've agreed to do. And if at some point I decide to not do it, then that's, that's just it. Like that's the end of this contract. That's the end of this job. I find something else to do or I move into a different position. It's if I change my mind, my entire life falls apart. Everything else goes to hell. Like I have nothing else to rely on because I decided I want a baby or I decided that like I want to step back a little bit. I don't want to be as intensely involved. You can't do that because when you do that, then you're going against Teal and you get kicked out and you get told that you're worthless. Next, we go back to Molly and she has a YouTube video up about to play and she's like, this is what I think is going to happen when I submit my report. And I don't know what movie this is from, but it looks like somebody in the movie is in possession of like the Ark of the Covenant, like from the Bible, and they put it in this wooden box and they lock it up and they seal it. And then somebody pushes it through a room full of very similar boxes. So it's like, basically, it's going to get locked up. It's going to get buried. Nobody's going to see this. She says, quote, they made it clear that they don't want to look at what I found, but it's frustrating to work this hard on something. And though I'm not attached to outcome, it's going to get shelved, end quote. Molly also says that she thinks Teal has found herself in a prison of her own making, which is a reference to a quote. Um, and the sentiment of that quote is that when you only do the things that please you instead of the things that make you fearful or challenge you, then you trap yourself and you are a prisoner in a garden of your own making. Then we see a montage of good things happening for Teal, and one of them is her receiving an award for contributions in the healthcare industry. I have no idea what organization hosted this award ceremony. I don't know what event it was. I don't know what award she specifically received because 
there, there's nothing a, like identifying in the clip that we see. And I tried to Google it and find what award it was, but I came up short, so I got no idea. But we see that, and then we see Teal getting her gold play button for having 1 million subscribers on YouTube, and Matthias is talking to someone about strategy for getting Teal a larger audience, and the person recommends Teal trying to get a spot as a guest on Joe Rogan, and he says, like, if she does that, she'll have her 2 million views right there. Teal is smiling at the thought of being able to do that, and then we hear someone thanking Teal for saving, quote, all of our lives, end quote. Next, we see Jared and who I assume to be his daughter, and they are smiling and hugging each other. And we hear Molly uh, in a voiceover say, quote, I have no way of knowing the ultimate effect that Teal Swan is having on all these different orbits of people around her, but I'm concerned about her followers because these are fragile people. For some of them, she is all they have, end quote. Next, we see footage of Sabrina and Amir. Sabrina is at a meet and greet event, getting a picture taken with Teal, and then Amir is on a mountaintop by himself. Next, we see Cyan giving out certificates to people who have now been certified to be practitioners of the completion process, and they're all super happy and excited and... Uh they just love getting that news. Congratulations to them. Cyan tells one of the newest practitioners that he's happy to have her as part of the family. Molly also says, quote, you're never completely whole when you separate from somebody that you're entwined with. When you leave, you almost have to become somebody else, but you have the power to change who you are, and I think it helps a lot to know you can do that, end quote. Then we see Juliana and Blake finally getting to go to Germany so Juliana can visit her family and Blake can finally meet them. There's lots of big hugs. There's laughter. Juliana is really excited and she says it's so surreal to see all of the street signs written in German. And we get like just different clips of um, Juliana like getting to see the family dog and she gets to ride her horse and she cuddles up by a fire with Blake. And they seem like just kind of small comforts but when you think about the impact of it of riding her horse being with her family this is my speculation um i would assume that juliana probably struggled with a little bit of a loss of identity when she went to go live with teal and when she was a part of the inner circle because her opinions weren't always respected when she told teal that they couldn't force people to be ready or when she was trying to stick up for Sabrina, she got shut down and she was told that she was the enemy. And so not only did she physically like lose, not lose her home, but left her home and she didn't have those things that she grew up with, but even emotionally, she wasn't free to be who she was. And so I just, it makes me happy to think about probably how peaceful it was and how happy she was to be there, to be home. It's always, I mean, if you have a good relationship with your family, it's always nice to go home and it's always nice to be with them. But then I think it's just even more amplified when you consider what she's been living with when she was living with Teal. Then we see Juliana and her mom having a private conversation and her mom starts this off by telling Juliana how she could barely take it when she was away and when she was in Teal's inner circle. And then Juliana tells her mom how difficult the past year was for her. Her mom affirms her and supports her by in this emotion by telling her that she did give up everything to go there and do what she did. And then Juliana talks about how hard it was because she was just a small piece in this big thing and she was trying to find herself and who she really wanted to be and what her place was. And then her mom asks Juliana if she found those answers. And even though Juliana is crying, she smiles and grabs her mom's hand. Next, we see Teal getting dressed for an event. And she says, quote, if I was to show you an image of the average person, they're walking around like a hollow shell. Loneliness is an epidemic on this planet. I don't want to live in the world like that. A person does not go looking for God unless they were missing something in humanity. You don't go looking for God unless people have failed you. What I found is an answer to that suffering. What I found was the place that I fit in. You realize that's everything. Finding meaning for your suffering is everything. End quote. They cut to a short clip of Blake in a forest and he's looking up at the trees and smiling and then he lays on the forest floor and just kind of puts his arms out. He stretches them out and he feels the leaves and the grass underneath him. And then we see Cyan and Tristan on stage at this event that Teal was getting ready for. They introduce Teal and she comes on stage and says, quote, wow, okay, by raise of hands, who here feels like they're in pain and like there's no way out of it? 
end quote. The majority of the people in the audience raise their hand and Teal smiles. Cut to the credits. Wow. So that was the last episode. There was a lot of turmoil. We saw a lot of things happen. It was just kind of like a roller coaster. And at the end, did we get a nice clean ending? No. We got the ominous tone of Teal smiling as she looks over, you know, a fresh batch of recruits of people who feel like things are not getting better. And uh, Teal thinking, ah, I can get my hooks in them. It's unsettling, it's ominous, but I think that was obviously an intentional last scene because it it shows that this is real life. Like, there's not a clean ending. It's not like a story or a movie or anything like that. This is what happens in real life. There are people who are complex, and whether they're making a positive or a negative impact, things can sometimes get murky and... uh, You can't always just say like, oh, well, here's a problem and this is how it comes to an end because Teal is still out here. She's still doing her thing. She is still holding workshops and making YouTube videos and impacting people's lives in ways that we might not ever know or be able to concretely say, oh, Teal had this impact on this person unless we hear them tell their story themselves. Overall, I really enjoyed the documentary. I think it did a good job of showing both positive aspects and negative aspects of Teal Swan and her practices, but I do think it was meant to uh, show kind of the issues with Teal and the things she does. I don't think it was meant to be like a pro-Teal doc, and so I do think it'll be interesting to see what Teal has to say about it when I do the reactions to her kind of debunking allegedly, what happened in the documentary or what was shown in the documentary. The one thing I was disappointed in, though, is that I was under the impression that they would go further into the story of Leslie Wainsgard, particularly because they mentioned her, like they talked about her. And while they didn't go into detail about it, it seemed like it was foreshadowing, like they were going to go deeper into her story in particular, and they didn't do that. So to be completely honest, I had planned to go over the details of what happened between Leslie and Teal in this video, but I have been filming for a very long time and my voice is about to give out. My throat is bothering the heck out of me. And so like, I don't want to try and rush through it. I don't want to try and force myself through it because it's a really important story. So I'm going to table it for now, but I will be going over what happened between Leslie and Teal in a future video. I think it's really important, one, not only to just have Leslie's story out there and not let her get brushed under the rug, but also having this knowledge is important to understanding how sinister Teal Swan can be. I think when you hear certain things Teal has said and done, it can be easy to write them off as one-offs or, you know, somebody who thinks they're doing a good job, but they're just a little bit misguided or maybe somebody who's a little bit emotionally hurt and so they're lashing out. Like, you hear certain things Teal has said and done and it can be easy if you're somebody like me who wants to give people the benefit of the doubt and wants to look for the positive. It can be easy to try and justify them. It can be easy to say, well, maybe this is why she did it. Maybe this is why she said that. And you try to kind of like explain away bad things that people have done because you're just looking for the positive in them. You're trying to give them grace. But sometimes people do bad things because they want to do bad things or because they're mean or because they're angry or because they don't care about other people. And so um, when you hear what happened between Leslie and Teal, I think that's a very clear indication that Teal's intentions are not always great. (laughs) Even now, even even knowing what I know, I have a tough time saying that like somebody's a bad person because I just don't think it's my place to make that judgment about somebody, but yeah. Teal's not the nicest person. Teal doesn't necessarily care, I don't think, about the people in her audience or the people that she says she wants to help. In my opinion, I think she sees a vulnerable sect of people and she knows that there are certain things that she can get from them. And so 
That's why she does a lot of the things that she does. When you start a movement based on a lie, it makes it very difficult for me to think that you have good intentions. So that's what I'm going to say about that. We're going to come to a close. Let me know what you think of Teal, of the deep end, of the series, anything that you want to say, leave it in the comment section down below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast version on Spotify, there isn't a comment section, but I will put up a Q&A where I will just say, you know, what are your thoughts on the series and what are your opinions on Teal Swan? And you can feel free to answer the question and kind of leave a comment, quote unquote, that way. Additionally, the audio version of this video is now available on Apple Podcasts. Podcast. I finally got everything figured out with that. So if that's where you prefer to listen to your content, it's there. It's ready for you. But with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. If you wouldn't mind liking this video or subscribing to my channel, if you're watching on YouTube, that would be incredible. If you're listening to the podcast, I would love it so much if you would leave a rating and review it because then we can spread the podcast. More people can hear it and uh, join in the conversation with us. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be awesome. And if you've already done any of those things, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.